The Lewis Burke Frumkiss Center for Writing and Culture at Hunter College presents 10 Years of Best-Selling Authors and Great Thinkers. Each week we broadcast new videos from our 10-year speaker archive online for free at our website. We look forward to seeing you again when it's safe. Please enjoy this presentation from the archives of the Lewis Burke Frumkiss Center for Writing and Culture at Hunter College. that so many people have turned out. It's, uh, with all the tragedy around us, this is one of the nice things that happens in New York City, even, even under the worst of circumstances. Culture goes on and, and uh, exciting events go on, especially at the Writing Center. We're downstairs, as you may know, we have a shelter where uh, several couple of hundred people are staying and, and the Hunter staff, uh, Elaine, I mean Lorraine, uh, Gallucci, who is the head of Continuing Ed, has been t taking care of them and uh, seeing to their every need and that the staff is uh, catering to them. Going on for days, Lorraine's hardly had any sleep, but, but that's uh, the kind of people that work at, at Hunter and we're very thrilled. We're also very thrilled about tonight. So let me tell you a little about uh, this evening, which is special because it's the first, um, well, please come in. We're short of seats and long on audience tonight, which is unusual but a happy circumstance. The annual Strong Cuevas Lecture, the first of which is being given tonight, will be given each year through the Hunter College Writing Center, CE, by an outstanding artist. But before I introduce Gay Talese, let me say a few words about our benefactor. Elizabeth Strong Cuevas is one of America's greatest sculptors who just this past summer was honored with a solo show entitled Premonitions in Retrospect at the prestigious Parish Art Museum in the Hamptons. In fact, it marked the first time an artist's exhibition was held in both the museum building and the domestic arts building. Space was given over to 40 works in cast bronze, fabricated aluminum, and steel, dramatic in their portrayals, Elizabeth's works simultaneously reflect past ages and look forward to the future, expressing the psychological co complexities of the human condition through variations of abstracted, stylized imagery based on the human head. If you have never seen one, some of them are 10, 12 feet tall, gleaming in the sun. They're primarily outdoors, but they're represented in all the great museums of the world, um, out in New Jersey in the Johnson Collection. Uh, there's one, and if you were ever out in Amagansett, Elizabeth maintains um, a for kind of uh, private museum uh, in, out there where you can view some of these great works, and certainly the Parish Art Museum has them. In any way, any rate, she, um, she and I cooked up this, uh, this uh, talk some time ago, and she was, she was uh, so generous in, in getting behind it, and uh, I am profoundly grateful to her. Uh, suffice that some of the most important collections in the world contain examples of her work, and if you have never seen one of them, take the opportunity to visit her at the museums in which she is represented, or go online. Her name is Elizabeth Strong Cuevas. You are in for a treat. This outsized artistic talent of hers is matched only by Elizabeth's great generosity, for which I am profoundly indebted. Which brings me to our first strong Cuevas speaker, the elegant and iconic writer, Gay Talese. And I suspect that's why most of you are here. Am I correct, or was it for the food? I don't know. <laughs> I always found that if you had Nobel laureate, a certain amount of people show up. You have Nobel laureate and pizza, major crowd. <clears throat> In short, Gay is a best-selling author who has written 11 books, among them such storied classics as The Power and the Glory, The New York Times, Honor Thy Father, The Incredible Tale of the Bonanno Crime Family, and The Filial Loyalty of a Son for a Father, which Gay researched at his own risk from the inside, Thy Neighbor's Wife, a shocking expose of the sex industry as it evolved after the sexual revolution in America and the changing views of morality, 
And candidly, uh, in this one, some of us found ourselves both admiring and privately envying Gay's incredible in situ research. <laughs> The, the book garnered some of the worst reviews in Gay's career, but also millions for his pocketbook. Uh, suffice that as a writer and journalist, Gay has established a reputation for reporting the so-called unreportable. And he does it better than anyone else on the planet. He was also credited by Tom Wolfe for having invented the new journalism, which Wolfe himself has practiced uh, so well for many, many years. Gay has written for the most important magazines and journals in the land, has covered the sports world with great aplomb, and is now progressing with a new book for Knopf based on his 50-year marriage to Nan Talese, one of the supreme editors and publishers in today's turbulent book industry. Gay does not suffer fools easily and is by turns considered one of the best-dressed writers in our profession, brilliant, acerbic, hysterically funny, and as they say in Italian, a real mensch. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure tonight to present our first strong Quavis lecturer, my good friend, and truly one of our best writers, Gay Talese, who will talk to you about what he sees as the impersonality of the new um, millennium. Gay? I'm going to have to put my Coca-Cola. This is a slope-shouldered table. And I'll say Coca-Cola will be all over me if I put it here. So excuse the interruption for myself. <clears throat> I am, of course, honored to be here. A pleasure to meet our, our, our patron, Lady Elizabeth, the artist. And I am <clears throat> also very glad that I live very close to Hunter. <laughs> I didn't have to look for a subway or a cab or, 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 or even walk very far. I've been, um, I've been in New York for more than a half century. And I, except for age, I haven't changed very much, at least in the way of working. When I was, when I was in my early teens, <clears throat> I wanted to be a journalist. And I wanted to get out of my hometown and be a big time journalist. My hometown is near Atlantic City, a town called Ocean City. And my father read the New York Times every morning. And I didn't read it because there were no comics, but I did read the sports page when I was young and still do. But I was interested in big time journalism because I'm really a small town boy in a, in a very um, provincial background. Great thing about wanting to be a journalist, it suits people who are shy. If you are shy and you're curious, and, and I am both, <clears throat> very, very curious, maybe more than shy, but in any case, in any case, the credentials that go with being a journalist, the press card, or the actual, the permission in a way to pry into the privacy of other people is, is something that caters very much to the mentality of people like myself. I came to New York in 1953 and began not as a reporter, but I began as a copy boy on the New York Times. And my job was <clears throat> carrying coffee up and down the 14th floor building and sandwiches to the various editors and reporters, delivering messages to various people on all the 14 floors of the, then, of the New York Times building as it then was 229 West 43rd Street. <clears throat> and what was so wonderful about that job, a copy boy job, is I got to meet such a variety of people. Not only the editors, not only the reporters, not only the copy readers, but the people in advertising, classified advertising, display advertising, the elevator operators, the truck drivers on the first floor who would wait for the delivery of the edition so they could tr truck it all over the city. Even outside the building, there were the mounted policemen who were there to make sure the traffic, Broadway traffic at theater time allowed the Times trucks to go through. You had a vast collection of people who had next to nothing in common except the daily miracle of producing and delivering the New York Times. 
It was a great place to be young when I was only 21 and to be living for the first time in a big town. When I got to be older, which is to say three years older, I finally did get a job as a reporter, elevating from copy boy, first to reporter in the sports department, two years later to reporter in the general news department. And the way I worked then, when I was in my early 20s, is the way I work now at the age of 80. I haven't changed a bit in the way I work. It's very much in the old tradition that I was taught when I was young by older practice reporters whom we all revered, even though none of them, or very few of them, are known today. And one of the lessons I was then, I was then taught, do not use the telephone. The telephone in those days was the new technology. And the reporters that were respected were those who got off, got, got outside the building and went by foot to where they were going to be interviewing people or where they were going to witnessing something. Whether it was a plane crash, or whether it was a storm, maybe not so severe as Sandy, but something that occasioned a neighborhood in crisis. Going there, seeing the people, seeing the gestures of the people, not necessarily listening word for word, because there were no tape recorders in those days, but trying to get the essence of how people spoke, what they meant even if they misspoke. And there was also both a tolerance on the part of journalists toward people and what they said, because sometimes people don't say what they mean or don't know how to say what they mean, or, or maybe are unable on short notice to communicate fully what they mean or think. So there was on the part of journalism as well as the people, a kind of trust that I don't think exists, exists today. <clears throat> in those days, people were more open. And I remember one of the first stories, the first stories I ever was assigned as a reporter was, I, I was told to cover a one alarm fire on West, 40, uh, West 37th Street between 9th and 10th Avenue. <clears throat> and I, I went to, um, I walked to, 37th Street, and I saw two fire trucks, but the, ho but the firemen were collecting the hoses. There was a barking dog on one of the trucks. People were looking down from the tenements, tenement buildings on both sides of 37th Street, and, and they were talking to one another. Uh, I went first to the fire, looked like the director of the, of, of the first fire, fire engine, and I said, where's the fire? He says, no fire. Oh. So it's just the one alarm, nothing fire typical. Okay, so in one sense, my assignment was not to be fulfilled. There was no fire. But there was a story. And the story that I saw was how people looking out the windows of these buildings that flanked the sidewalk, looking down at the, at the fire trucks, looking down at the dog, and looking down at the pedestrians who were looking for a fire that wasn't there and talking from their second floor, third, third floor, or fourth floor window, sometimes standing on the fire escapes, just talking to one another. And, it looks, and I could hear much of what was being said. And what I did was to listen to the dialogue. And I have with me tonight, which is what I always had when I was a young reporter and still, as I say, follow the same practices that I've always followed. These cardboard, these little white boards you see are really my notepad, and what they really are, are shirtboard. The, the, if some of you who get shirts back from the laundry pro may well throw that away as trash. I never threw it away as trash. I always thought it as a very wonderful functioning part of my work to cut shirtboard in five pieces, then I trim it around the edges, because as Lewis Frumkin says, I care about, I wouldn't want to have something sticking out of my handsome jacket here, so I tuck it down, and what I do is take notes. And what I was doing on that particular day on West 37th Street, was taking notes and listening. One of the real um, qualities, in addition to curiosity, is the ability to and the patience to listen. And I was hearing what people were saying. And it wasn't shocking. It was routine conversation of a neighborly place during the time when from the moment of peril, as was the first alarm, maybe people said, what's going on here? And then now we are a half hour later. There's no fear. There's no fire but there still is a story. So I wrote that story for the next day's paper. Just what you saw and what you heard on a, on a typical 
street of a one alarm passing event worthy hardly of record. And that way of reporting, of being there, not using a phone, if I called a phone, I called the fire department, oh, there's a fire on 37, oh, the guys, nothing, it's all over. So it's, the story's all over. The story's never over. Even when you write this story, it's not over because people that you write about one day are still alive a year later, two years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, sometimes. And you can always follow up on what you wrote. And that was the way I worked as a, as a young reporter and later on as a reporter who could write for the Sunday magazine, meaning I had more space, more time, I had a week instead of a day. And also later on still writing for monthly magazines such as Esquire once was a great one in the 1960s of writing books, some of which were mentioned by Louis Frumkis tonight. But I'm speaking of me in a time that for most of the young people I've come to see on my way into this building, the students, the students at Hunter, the students of every university across this country are very, very different in the way they see the world, the way they communicate, and the way they accept communication from other people than was the case when I was young as some of these students that I met in the elevator and down in the lobby as I came in. And it makes me worry a little bit. Not that I'm, not, not that I'm gonna be around long enough to worry too much about these young people, but I do worry about those few who might have aspirations common to my own when I was young, to be a journalist. Maybe not a print journalist, maybe another kind of journalist, although I don't know what these new journalists are. As Lewis says, I was a new journalist. Well, that was a long, long time ago. But what the new journalists today sometimes defies what I would call description because I don't exactly know in the age of blogging and the age of using the internet so much as a research tool to say nothing of a way of communicating otherwise through, through typing. I don't know what exactly is the, is the prevailing case for the young students in journalism departments and journalism schools. But I can tell you that Sometimes when I'm asked to speak to journalism schools that I have on occasion, Columbia, NYU, <clears throat> even out of town, Yale, and, and, and once at U.S. University of Southern California, and I, I'm standing in front or sitting in front of a group of students, and I'm telling them how I work, and I'm to myself thinking, you're never going to get a job. Or if you get a job, you're never going to be able to do what I do because you're not gonna be able to have the luxury of being there, of traveling, sometimes on foot, sometimes on bus, sometimes on airplanes, if someone could give you an expense account, to go far away to actually see what there is to be written about and to listen with care to what people are saying and to get the meaning that sometimes is not verbal through gestures or maybe, or maybe sometimes having the patience to listen to people and to make notes and then to say, I do not understand. When you have a tape recorder, you get verbatim what people say. There's a seat right up here, yeah, yeah, I mean, right there. You're right in the best seat in the house, right there. Um, you don't hear what people are saying you, um, because it's on tape. And reporters today often don't listen because it's on tape, verbatim, word for word. Well, word for word isn't really worth listening to much of the time. Any more than I, as a, as a person who struggles over paragraphs when I'm writing, if I were to have to type and use for publication the first sentence I wrote, my first draft, it would be terrible. I wouldn't understand it, you wouldn't understand it. And so it is also true when people speak on the record. It is no wonder, as I got a little bit older in my 30s, when you realize we're, we're in the age of the sound bite, the tape recorder was the first e evil device of the new technology. Because what it did was cause people to be cautious, cause people to worry about saying something wrong, or if they were political people, to make a mistake, to say something, but then on review, to wish I hadn't said it that way. I wish I had kept my mouth shut. In my time, and in the spirit of my work, I have respect for people making mistakes 
when talking to me, and I always go over it with them. I never submit my work either in the written form or in the researching form to people for the review, but I always share my understanding of what I heard with them and give them, in fact, encourage them to improve upon, quote, I don't use tape recorders, they said. I don't even have a cell phone. I don't use the technology in any way that I think is important to what I do, because what I do is being there. It's the art of hanging out. It's hanging out with people you're writing about. It's showing up. And so I don't need any kind of technical assistance. All I need is a shirt board, a pen, an extra filter, perhaps, and my feet. And when I talk to people, I remember once, once in 1962, I was then in my, I think it was 30, just turned 30, and I was interviewing a prize fighter who at that time was the heavyweight champion named Floyd Patterson. He wasn't a great fighter. He would be destroyed a couple years later by <clears throat> Sonny Liston and finally by Muhammad Ali. Patterson wasn't a great fighter, but he was a wonderful thinker and one who could describe what it is like to be in a ring, to be a fighter. And on one time I remember in the spring of 62 when I went to his training camp in the Catskills, he was fighting, I don't know who he was fighting, but I asked him, Floyd, Floyd, what is it like to be knocked out? What is it really like? I see it on television, I've been to fights and I've seen it in person. But I've never felt and I've never heard anybody describe to me what it is like. And he started. Floyd Patterson it was in his bedroom. It was in a building away from the training camp and where his ring was and where his trainers were. And he started talking. He said, well, first thing, it, it's not like in those cartoons you see stars. I mean, you're always in your, in your stars in the head of a guy that was bis knocked out to the, knocked on the floor of a ring. Actually, he said, you get a feeling, a sort of a benevolent feeling when you're knocked out. It's kind of a, you're, you're definitely in a state of removal, but you also feel, he says, I felt, and he was knocked out a lot. Floyd Patterson, I said he wasn't a great fighter, but he had a great capacity to get up from the floor. People who are my age and knew something about, or read something about prize fighting, know that Patterson was knocked down more times than any fighter and got up more times than any fighter. And when you want to know about what it's like to be knocked out, he was the authority. And he started talking about this feeling that you're well-liked when you're knocked out. You feel on the floor, you're decimated, de de debilitated, you're embarrassed. But he said, you know, you feel like you're in love. Really, when you're in love, you're knocked out. Yes, he said, it's really a strange feeling. So I didn't know if I understood him. I went over, I said, let's start again, Floyd. Let's start again. And we started again. And then I wasn't satisfied, we started again. It took me two hours that day to get through that quote, and I wasn't finished. The next day, I saw him again. I said, let's go over it again. I wanted to get fully, during a period of reflection on the part of this prize fighter, who probably hadn't had much experience being interviewed in depth, because in those days, and these days, the prize fighter's interview is a microphone is thrust in his face, and he explains why he lost, or why he won, or how did he win, and what did what punch did it? It's all a matter of two or three minutes between commercials after a fight. But what I wanted and what I got finally was a fully described uh, insight into being knocked out. In a way, I made, and I do this with almost everybody I interview. I made. Patterson a partner in the privacy of his own life and how he expressed it, how he felt it, how he communicated it. I showed him the notes I had on my cards. And then I said, here, can, can, can we improve upon this? Because sometimes, especially a prize fighter who is not the most 
in a formal sense, educated of people, and certainly not articulate in the way that many people who are professors at Hunter are. But let's say that with cooperation on both sides, a trust on both sides, without giving up anything in the way of, of the, the, the authority one has over what one writes, and the prerogative of giving to the public, the reading public, an assurance that what they are reading has been unedited by the people you're writing about, uncensored. All of that aside, I got from Patterson and hundreds of people since a sense that I got it from their point of view and fully understood what they knew to be true about themselves. Today, as I said, I looked around before I came up here, and I saw what variety there is within Hunter. I'm told the enrollment is something in excess of 20,000. Just looking at the faces, sometimes, sometimes looking at people and how they're dressed, how they move, how they comport themselves, something you can pick up in maybe an hour of, of strolling around such a building as this. You realize that, that it's like a United Nations here, a student body. And you really realize that it's the perfect place, New York, for such a diverse representation of the world and its young people. The um, thing I also noticed, though, is most of these people are spending a good deal of time with their eyes downcast on the little things that they're holding in their hands. And when I was a young reporter, the age of these people, I always liked to look up to the second story as I traveled through the city of New York, this great, wonderful center of merchandising and masterful, masterful people. But if you wander around any street in this city, except for this street where there's not many small shops upon which to look up and see the kind of shop that's on the second floor or the third floor, you see such things as within two minutes of where we are, incredible diversity of endeavor. People that fix clocks, people that make dollhouses, people that cut hair for dogs and all the variety of things you see. And you don't see much when you're looking into that little thing you're carrying. And that's all the way through this building and every building where there are young and old people. I mean, it's probably true in an old age home as much as it is at Hunter. This is the technology that I don't welcome because, because I keep looking back at a time when it was perhaps, perhaps more difficult to get information. I remember you used to have to you, we once had something called a telephone book, and you look up numbers of people. You flip through, and you f see the person, or you think you see the, see the name of the person you're looking for, but you also see other names you didn't know was there. And sometimes you quite coincidentally come upon well-known people, and you say, gee, that they're listed. I mean, or, or, or sometimes you, you just, when I was researching at the New York Times, we had what was known as a morgue. It, meant it was like the library, the research floor. Uh, room. And you go back and they give you packs of old newspapers. You flip through. Maybe you're doing a, st a story on, on, on uh, maybe politician, uh, Tom Dewey or whoever it was. And you go looking at all the clippings and you see other clippings related to Tom, the governor, Tom Dewey at that time. And there was something that had nothing to do really with Dewey, but something to do with his time. And you'd come upon quite by accident information that was the source of another story. Just like my little fire story was the source of another story. And sometimes what is what we call serendipity has been diminished by this time when the educated classes communicate with one another through the technology. And worse, the classes are communicating with their like num member classes. They're, I mean, the educated classes having the, 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 the experience the affluence to afford whatever it is that makes life easier caters to the generation, I suggest now, the younger generation, 
to their capacity to be goal-oriented. Um, they, are, they are a generation that definitely wants to get ahead or you wouldn't be in a place like this. And the competition to get into a place like this, to Hunter, or any college, is enormous. So the preparations and the, the shortcutting or the, the, what, what, the pragmatism, the, nece the necessity of focusing to be focused. They say, oh, you must be focused, focused. The last thing you really want to be is focused, I think, was you want to be unfocused and wander around and take the time and the patience to discover what you don't know is there, not to ask questions that are easily answered or answer or seek to find information, push the buttons and get it. Because you're really getting and reinforcing a narrow vision. You're getting, you're getting information that is too easily gotten. And also I think, I think that sometimes the, the ability to acquire information with speed as you can by Googling your way through the day, you get it. You don't have to waste a lot of time looking and not, not finding immediately what you think you want. I think, I think there's a lot of knowledge that's lost. I don't think, well, I think before we talk so much about Hurricane Sandy, the big story in this town was the murder by a nanny from the Dominican Republic of the two crim children. Everybody was horrified, the tabloids and then the daily paper of the New York Times and the New York Observer, all of them, pointed out what we all knew. It was, it was heinous, it was un, uh, hard to explain. Hard to explain, how could this happen? These people were good. They went to the Dominican, met with relatives of this woman who had worked for them perhaps more than a year. And little we know about that woman which the reporters did let us know about, was that she lived in a crowded apartment with her 17-year-old son and other female relatives <clears throat> jammed into an apartment somewhere on the Upper West Side. I forget where. But what I, th what I thought, without making, without decrying or casting blame on the victims, this is not meant but what I thought, if I was a reporter, I'd want to know, I'd want to know, or I would wonder, I'd say, but what I would wonder and later find out, how come so little was known about this woman by their employer? That sounds horrible. A lot of people say, well, oh God, what a stupid remark. No, I mean that it's characteristic of our time in this city that's supposed to be the most egalitarian of all, with our election tomorrow, trying to deal with basic equality being reinforced, no matter whether you're of the right or the left, Romney or Obama, makes no difference. But I think that we don't know much about people. We don't know much about our candidate. We don't know much about our murderess of the week, that woman from the Dominican that took the lives of those two crim children. We just don't know, because we're so centered through the technology on what it is we want to know or think we should know, but we don't know and don't get information from sources that might be more difficult to reach but are, might, might be explained the other side of every story, because there is, as you know, as we all know, many sides to every story. And I wonder, maybe Dostoevsky, if he was working for the New York Post, would be able to tell us what it was like to be that woman, because so many of the characters in great literature are the characters that we, in real life, ignore and how you could uh, uh, have this woman going to somebody's, one child's dance lesson and the other child's swimming lesson and, and you have her in your house but you don't have a clue how she lives and what it is like to be living in, the, in this city of opportunity in such an inopportune place and time. This is not to forgive anybody. This is not certainly to tolerate anything of the, uh, even approaching what, what happened. This is not to blame anybody but it's to wonder it's to wonder how little do we know. And I see these people that are sometimes in classrooms that I stand before or in this place, this Hunter or Yale or USC or wherever it is, 
so much emphasis on getting, looking down and getting it through, through your own uh, uh, concentration with and relationship with machines we carry in our hip pocket. It's one of the things that concerns me in my very, very, very senior years as an observer and chronicler of the life that a reporter sees and writes about. Louis Frumk has told me, please don't go on too long. He said there are questions. And so I'm going to take the liberty of asking you if you have any questions, perhaps something I did not touch upon, or if I did, gives you reason to want to ask a lot, a lot or criticize some part. Yes. Yes, you are near the camera. Hold on for one second. We're coming with a microphone. So as a young reporter starting out, or the young journalist you're talking of, um, do you think it's possible to get a job at a, the New York Times or a magazine or a newspaper and report in this traditional way? Do you think with the way technology is so centered in newsrooms around the world, I mean, is it possible? Do they have the time to go out and report like the way you did? Or yeah, do you I think, think that's is. lost? Like a lost I think that when I, when I started as a copy boy, oh, you always thought, <clears throat> I'll never be able to do what other, like Meyer Berger, or some of the great people when I was young, people we looked up to. You read, I don't know, do you read, the, do you read the, a newspaper in paper or you look on the online? Well, if, if the students here, and I don't see many students in this room, but I mean, there are students in this building of 20,000, if I'm to believe the number. I'll bet, like you, great percentage of them, maybe 80% read online. There's one mistake right there. You're never going to get anything out of you. Because when you look online, you're looking for what you want. You want to know about maybe your ballet. You want to know about some ballet review last night or some score of the New York Knicks or what. And you're, again, focused. You're focused. You're goal-oriented. That's, that's not the way you read a newspaper. You read a newspaper, you flip through it and read everything. And I was just give you an example. Just a couple examples come to mind of what I read this week. It was remarkable and testifies to the fact there are terrific reporters. One reporter named <clears throat> Michael Powell, I believe, he wrote a column so it doesn't appear every day, like once or twice a week. It's called Gotham. And, and he wrote about um, a very wealthy person whose last name is Polson, who's a hedge fund person. He was not his first name. What is it? John Polson. And all of the people who write for um, the, the, the New York Observer, for example, a great editorial and other newscasters I happen to watch on television were saying what a great thing this man, this very, very wealthy man, is giving trillions to Central Park. Except Mr. Powell, the New York Times, didn't see it that way. He said, what about these other parks? I mean, the parks I never heard of. There must be so many parks. And the self-aggrandizement, he was suggesting strongly, Mr. Powell, of this Mr. Paulson. And I thought, boy, that's an interesting way of seeing it, seeing the other side. Example two, in the same day's paper, I think this is October the 31st, do I remember? It was a week before, yeah, but a week ago. In the same day's paper, on the editorial, on the op-ed page, another great reporter, whose name is Joe Nocera, and he wrote a column um, criticizing the New York Times, in a way, for bringing to New York the new CEO who had for years been director of the BBC, Mark Thompson, I think his name is. Mr. Nocera is writing a week ago about questioning the wisdom of bringing to be the chief, um, the, this, the, the ch CEO, the wisdom uh, of bringing this person who knew so little, presumably, about the scandal in, 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 in involving Mr. S Mr. Savile, was it a Savile? And he, the, he, he uh, no, Sarah's asking, how can the New York Times, this bastion of freedom of information and explore, exploratory journal, 
bring to he head the, the institution and help it earn more money through his digital genius, a person who doesn't know what's going on in his own company. And here's a guy working for Mr. Sulzberger. In fact, Sulzberger, the publisher, Arthur Hayes, uh, Arthur Ox Sulzberger Jr., the present publisher, had had approved. In fact, continues to give um, a kind of defense of his appointee from Link from England. And may, 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 maybe it is true, although I can't believe it should be true, that this Mr. Mr. Thompson would not know what's going on, having been the boss of, of BBC for a number of years. If he didn't know, he should have known that old cliche. But that is in the New York. Now, how many newspapers during the era of Hearst or the era of Pulitzer or, or, or Thatcher or the Herald Tribune, this is when I was young and no one remembers there was a Herald Tribune, no one would have published that except Salzburgers. New York Times, and even Salzberger was knocked around in his own paper by Nocera. I mean, it's got this great journalism. So you say, is it possible to be Powell? Is it possible to Nocera? Is it possible to be um, uh, some uh, Dan Barry? If you ever read great journalism, you ever read Dan Barry? I mean, this stuff, these guys are every bit and probably better than me. So, and they're of a generation closer to yours than mine. So I don't believe that the era of, of, for young people to aspire to be worthy journalists is over. And because it's so important, more important now than when I was young, because there's so little, so little you can believe in the world of communication. It's so, you can't believe photographs. The technology allows you to doctor photographs, to change people's faces. You don't know who you're watching, who you're seeing. So you really need the veracity of dedicated people now more than ever. So I think it's a worthy aspiration because you're needed now more than when I was around when those old gents were telling me, don't use the phone. Those people are not around anymore. Right now, they're just, they're just looking for a quick return on their investment, meaning speed in journalism, get it first, not get it right, get it first. And all the, uh, half of the mistakes that are made uh, including some in the New York Times. You can read the corrections. The first thing you should read each day is look at the correction pages and the speed. They get the name wrong. They don't ask the questions. They don't, they get the, you know, they have to spell the name. God knows how do you spell their first name unless you should get that right. Or the name of an Arthur Miller play should be right. You should get it right. Here I am ranting, but I, I'm trying to ask you a question. Norman. <laughs> Wait, they um, want your microphone here. I think the difference between then and now by reason of the technology is that we have to accept the reality of living in a larger world, um, an infinite, infinite space and not a community with definable boundaries. And this creates anxiety, uncertainty. Um, and, and has created the difficulties uh, that I think we're experiencing. I think that, regrettably, truth comes more from fiction now than factual reporting. I mean, the sense of truth. I just told you a few nights ago, I went to see a play. <clears throat> it's in Lincoln Center, but it isn't big. It's a little place in Lincoln Center, well, the T.O.W., I think is the name of the theater. And there's a play by a first-time playwright whose name I can't even tell you. It's called Disgraced. And there are four characters, and they very much represent New York. There are four different characters. One, the main character, a man uh, who's an attorney, and his origins are Muslim. His blonde, blue-eyed wife, American-born, in the play is an artist. The other two people, their close friends, are a married couple, and one of them is an African-American, well-educated kind of woman who played almost like a Mich Michelle Obama kind of perky, educated, feminine, smart combination, even to the point of dressing like Michelle Obama with those beautiful arms that you know have been worked out who could wear short sleeve blouses. 
And her husband is Jewish, strong defender of Israel. Those four people are having dinner. That play, which is not even, um, doesn't even have an intermission, is 90 minutes of riveting reality. If any, I'm here I am selling like a press agent. But what I'm saying is the complexity of origins and the clashes through the lack of knowing one another is, is so edifyingly presented in this play by this playwright I never heard of. But I'm going to do, I'm going to make it my business to somehow get to meet him. Some, somehow, I'm sure I will. It's not hard. But that is not something you read necessarily in your foreign reporting. I've been reading with great patience and time-consuming interest. Every, every day, I spend two hours or so reading the New York Times, and I also read the tabloids, and I read the Observer, on, and I read the New Yorker, and I read Sometimes I read other magazines as well, what little time is left after what I mention. But you still don't know anything about the Taliban. Taliban. I still don't know what is the difference between an insurgent uh, and a militant. And I don't know really how it is, in what, to what degree, to what degree can we label someone a terrorist? any more than see ourselves as terrorists in dispensing these drones. I just think the drone is a form of terrorism, except the terrorist at least has the good grace to kill themselves for what they believe. Whereas the drone is so impersonal, it is so calculatingly covert. Pushing a button in a bedroom in Cleveland can send a drone somewhere in Afghanistan to blow up a reputed insurgent or a militant or so. We don't know who we're killing. Why don't we know? Why don't we? Because we don't have the reporting to, t to focus on that. So reporting too often is reporting what important people say. I don't believe what they say. I mean, what, what someone in the Pentagon says is no less true now than it was when Rumsfeld was working for the younger President Bush. Who believed Rumsfeld as Secretary of Defense? I don't believe anybody in, in Obama's administration. We all, what, whether we are pro or con, I don't care about those candidates going to find out who they are tomorrow. But they're, the, the way the, the government of the United States is not making friends around the world, in fact, is losing them, is one of the concerns I carry to my grave. And where the deficiency, with all due respect to the encouraging the young man be a journalist, there's a, there's a future for this or need for this, there is more of a need than even, I'm, even I know, because you can tell, you, tell yourselves how little we know about the people for whom we're we're sacrificing so much, so lives of so many American soldiers to say nothing of the people we're blowing up. So how little we know. So it isn't just the woman who lost two children, and we don't know who this woman from the Dominican is, any more than we knew the woman from in that hotel with Dominic Strauss-Kahn. We just don't know. And how do we find out? Well, we have to find out. We can't do it through Google. You can't, do, you can't Google your way to this kind of information. It takes a lot of t patience, but it has to be ask, asking the right question. Who are these Taliban? Who, how are, they, they must be, they have, they have wives, they have children, they have, someone goes to school, they must have, they must have something in a human, do we need a playwright? Do we need, do we need uh, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marcus to tell us? Do we need uh, uh, the aforementioned um, was it Tolstoy or something? We should have this in our factual reporting, and we're very derelict in duties, as journalists, I mean, and going overseas and telling us who the enemy is. We don't know who the enemy is. So how can we have a foreign policy that means something to all of us, because we don't know to what degree people are foreign and to what they're, are they like us? I mean, there's such a mystery to this kind of n lack of knowledge in this time of technology and know-it-all. Good evening. It's been a real pleasure. Thank uh, you. In your day-to-day -day writing, do you use any of the new technology? Do I not? use any of the new technology? No. I told you I, <clears throat> I make notes with a pen. And what I do, though, is I go home after, uh, or if I'm on the road, if I'm in a hotel, I will go home every night and type from my cards. I save my cards store them away so I have the 
but I know I can't get everything. How hardly do I get 50%? Which is why, but I type it. I do type it. And I put the date, you know, November 5th, not 2012, Hunter Collins, blah, blah. And I write maybe a page or two, whatever it is, of my notes. And I put my notes then, staple the notes. And if I'm working on a long piece that takes, oh, maybe a month or so, like I have in recent years, spent, um, oh, I've spent a couple of months on a story, a couple of New Yorker pieces I've done recently. One I remember a year and a half ago, and an opera singer took me, I was on the road with her about four weeks, the soprano I wrote about, and then I, then I wrote recently about the manager of the Yankees. That took me over a three-month period, or more than that. I watched, you know, and then I took notes all the time. And it wasn't that I interviewed him so much. I, I wanted to watch him. Watch him in, during, in, in forms of, of, of how he how he reacted to a losing team or a winning team. He had both been a winner and loser as a ball player. I did a lot of research, though. I did a lot of research without him. In order to get Joe Girardi, I'm talking about, in case you... In order to get Joe Girardi, he has four, brother, four brothers and one sister. One of them, the sister lives in South Carolina, and the brothers live in Chicago, East uh, Peoria, and one lives in Denver. I went and saw all those people. I spent days with those people. I wanted to get the Joe Girardi story from his siblings, so the more five people's point of view of one person. You get variety there. And insight, but it's varied. That's how I work. Last question was over here. Over here, but before this gentleman asked the question, I just want to mention that when we finish, Gay will be happy to inscribe books. We have many of his books back there. He'll be sitting there. You can ask him questions once you've purchased a book. We will also have wine and uh, refreshments, whatever are left that you didn't eat before. <laughs> Go ahead, this gentleman. This uh, is, of course, the most important dialogue of our time. You know this, and many other people know this, in some of them in this room. I've lived for the last 20 years on an Indian reservation. And no one here knows anything about indigenous people. That's the basic point that you're trying to say about the Taliban. We don't know our history. We don't know our culture. I just read a quote uh, that uh, Michael Foucault had at the end of uh, his series on um, uh, human sexuality. And he's quoting uh, Dixon from 1982 in Greek mythology, Greek homosexuality, where he's basically saying that in the fifth century, the Greeks didn't know, uh, uh, you know, they were an inferior culture to other richer cultures. Um, and what you say in your examples is, has these little nuances of profundity that we all really need to address in our daily lives. And your life has been that way. That's what you write about. That's what you speak about tonight. Do you see within the response of this gentleman in terms, and, and within, you yourself gave a hint of what the future holds that allows hope to come forth. Do you see that sense as far as you have uh, uh, worry? Do you see that sense of continuance beyond the seventh generation as indigenous people believe in? Yes, yes, I do, and I see it in this building. Potentially, it's right in this very building that I see the future of journalism because this building encapsulates what you see in newly arrived people to the, to the promised land, if you want to be that metaphorical about it. When I was a journalist, we were the underclass. My, my, I was born in 1932. <clears throat> my father was from Italy. My mother was from a ghetto in Brooklyn of Italians and Jews mixed up in, in a neighborhood. I was the first person my uh, family went to college. When I joined the New York Times, I told you, I didn't tell you this, most of my fellow reporters and also, I, by, I include desk people. We were, we were of the underclass. We were Jews, Italians, Irish, blacks as they were, or negros as they were called then. Not many, but we were all. 
and we, when we went out to, to especially those of us who, who were reporters of important stuff, meaning political reporters, who covered the mayor, who covered the state government, who covered the federal government, who were in Washington working and covering the Senate, et cetera, those people, when they were interviewing officials, were usually interviewing people who were better educated in a formal sense than they were who went to the better schools, Harvard, the same better school, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you know, Stanford, uh, you name it. We were, obs uh, we, we journalists were not from the elite schools. I went to the University of Alabama, as you know how unelite I am. And, um, but people went to NYU, CCNY, you know, some of them came from other states, maybe from Drexel or, or now, journalists, not that I know them well, but Harvard, Yale, they are in Washington going to the same social clubs, swimming in the same swimming pool with people in government. The, the, so, so you don't have the underclass in journalism, partly because journalists are too well-educated. The, 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 the reverse of that, the undereducated or the educated in a not formal way was what makes the great journalists or good journalists because you have to be looking outside in. Today, the journalists are inside. And I never saw this more representative of during the Iraq war, 2003, 2004. Journalists were embedded with the damn military. There's nothing more outrageous than to see journalists embedded with the US military. How could you not be other than a, a mascot to the military? There was not the separation between the issues and the forces of the Defense Department or the federal government or the international, you know, the, 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 the government of the United States. Journalists should not be taken in. So this whole generation from Watergate, that's, that's where we think Woodward and Bernstein. But most of the time, the weapons of mass destruction uh, hoax was fomented by the New York Times as well as other, other papers believers of Rumsfeld and all those other naive people who were taken in by the first for the by the uh, Bush administration during during the uh, during the invasion of Iraq and the weapons of uh, Judy Miller and all those people we know about but we didn't know about it so well then and all all that led to what you are too well aware of the atrocities of Iraq which still go on we haven't won a thing in Iraq we're withdrawing I have withdrawn but didn't achieve a thing now this is where journalism is wrong and I think it's wrong because the people who are journalists are too damn educated in the wrong way. They are socially equal to the people they're writing about. Now, what about, I didn't get my point. My point is this building, coming up the elevator, seeing these people, they don't look like Harvard material to me. They, they look like people who could be like me. They're like, like some people I saw in that play the other night uh, the, 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 called, called Disgraced, the underclass, whether they're Asian, whether they're... I don't know where they're from. There's a lot of different faces, a lot of coloring I see in the elevator. I wonder, though, if those people in the elevator, if they're really curious. I saw a blind student in his school. And I thought, does anybody interview the blind student? Maybe you have many blind. I just saw one feeling, away, feeling his way along the wall. And I thought, does he use a cell phone? And if he does, does any of these bright students here, curious students, writers, maybe they work on the, I guess they have a, a, a school paper here. If they do, how do people who are blind use a cell phone? Are there, I mean, this is obvious, you see the person, I saw this person today, he's in the school. Questions like that are with a very curious person who could be a reporter like you, but you have to have, to have a sense of separateness, a curiosity, that's not funneled through some faculty that gets it all right the first time. You want the reverse of that. You want the undereducated, the very curious, and with that particular way of looking at the world, or looking at a blind man looking at a cell phone. I mean, is that, is that, I haven't seen a blind person with a cell phone, but I'm curious. And there's a story for somebody in this building. You, if you, you're, not, you're not in this building, but there's a story. Having, knowing what a story is, it wasn't the one alarm fire. It's the story you saw the people talking and what they said, that's all. This doesn't answer your question, but it certainly leads us to another question, doesn't it? Well, we don't have time. <laughs> Gay, thank you for a uh, incisive, insightful talk, a brilliant talk. Hope you all enjoyed it. Come meet Gay. 
back there, have some wine with him, let him inscribe a book for you, and ask him any other questions you may have. Thank you, Gay. Thank you very much.